In times like this, I like to reflect on those who have encountered great personal difficulty and turned it into even greater civic opportunity. Take Helen Keller, for instance. She, at 19 months old, contracted an unknown illness that left her unable to speak or to hear. She overcame these physical limitations to become the first deaf and blind person to receive a bachelor's degree. She wrote 12 books to inspire countless numbers of people to overcome their own struggles and shortcomings. Corey Tenbo. She overcame sexism to become the first woman watchmaker in Holland and used her residence to secretly hide and rescue Jewish refugees during the Holocaust. She was sent to concentration camps and she overcame starvation and death as she miraculously was released due to a clerical era. She wrote the best-selling book, The Hiding Place, to help others overcome their fears to stand up for what they believe. Louis Zamperini. His plane crashed in the Pacific during World War II and he overcame being lost at sea for 42 days. He overcame being beaten and tortured as a POW for two years. He overcame both resentment and bitterness as he returned to Japan after the war and forgave those who had tortured him. Johnny Erickson Tata. She became a quadriplegic after a diving accident at the age of 17. She overcame overwhelming physical and emotional pain as she learned to paint and write with her teeth. For over 50 years, she has helped millions of people overcome their fears to find hope and meaning in life. John Perkins. He has been a friend not only to me, but to our church as I've been with him at his home in Mississippi, and we've had him speak right here. He overcame both resentment and bitterness as he forgave the two white police officers who arrested him without charge and nearly beat him to death just for being a black man. He continues to help others overcome the racism and injustice that plagues our country as he has written 17 books and has become known as the grandfather of urban ministry. Each of these men and women, they possess a relentless drive and unceasing passion that has empowered them to overcome just about anything. But this is the question I want to ask you today. What fuels that relentless drive, that unceasing passion? That's what I want to speak with you about this Easter. Grab your Bible from the shelf, open it up to John chapter 20. I want to welcome those from our newest location in Cincinnati, Ohio. Grateful to have you as part of the High Point family. We're starting a new series. It's entitled Overcomers. And we're going to examine the infusion of the resurrection power that fueled the early disciples to overcome their fears and failures, their discouragement and disbelief, their disappointment and despair, their setbacks and sadness. And make no mistake, that's the same power that fueled Helen Keller, Corey Ten Boom, Louis Samperini, Johnny Erickson Tata, and John Perkins to overcome the challenging circumstances they faced. And that's the same power that's available to help us, you and I, overcome the challenging circumstances we're facing right now. The title of the message is this, Overcoming Disbelief. And this is ground zero when it comes to accessing the resurrection power in our own lives. I want to give you several thoughts that have helped me to overcome the disbelief that has plagued and plateaued me in my own life. And my hope is that these will help you to reach a new altitude of faith and belief. Let's begin with this thought. When it comes to the resurrection, I need to check it out for myself. Notice verse 1 and 2. That's exactly what we see happening as there's many first. Now, on the first day of the week, that's Sunday, that is the first Easter morning. It says, Mary Magdalene, she came to the tomb early while it was still dark, and she saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Now, Mary, she was the first to the tomb. Why? Well, it was because all that Jesus had done for her. I mean, he gave her a fresh start. He gave her a new lease on life. He redefined who she was by loving her where she was at. And it's the same thing he does with us. That is the power of the resurrection. But what did she do next? So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple. So catch this. She is not only the first to the tomb, she is the first evangelist. 
She's the first one to tell what had happened after Jesus had died. Now, granted, she was worried and she was unsure and uncertain what was happening, but she's the first one to share some news. Now, the other disciple, when it says this, we know Peter, he's the one that denied Jesus. He comes, the other disciple with him, that's John. And John does this. He kind of, he never identifies himself in any of his writings. And so you kind of got to guess who it is. And it, it sounds really humble until he says this, the one who Jesus loved. So think about that for a moment. I wonder how the other disciples reacted when he said, well, I'm the one that Jesus loved. And I'm not sure if it sounds as humble as it ought to, but seriously. And she said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they laid him. So then in verses three through five, Peter went with the other disciple. And again, that's the reminder, who's the other disciple? It's the one that Jesus loved. And they went together. Both of them were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the term first, followed the bouncing ball. That's John. And so he wants us to know, the humble guy, that he beat Peter in the race. And, and stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. See, they did this. They took a mad dash to the tomb. That's what happened on that very first Easter. I remember when I did the very same thing. I wasn't running to a tomb, but I was running to check out who this Jesus was and what he had done. Two books were extremely helpful to me. One was by Josh McDowell, a former agnostic, and he wrote a book called More Than a Carpenter. He also wrote a book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, which was very, very helpful to me in those days when I was running to check this out for myself. I was in my late 20s. Another book that was written by uh, Lee Strobel, and he was a former atheist and investigative reporter for the Chicago Tribune, and he wrote a very well-known book called The Case for Christ, which actually got turned into a movie. And those books helped me to figure this out. Some of the quotes that were helpful, let's look what Josh McDowell said. After I set out to refute Christianity intellectually, and I couldn't, I came to the conclusion the Bible was true and Jesus was God's son. He went on to say this, I spent months in research. I even dropped out of school for a time to study in the historically rich libraries of Europe and I found evidence, evidence in abundance, evidence I would not have believed had I not seen it with my own eyes. Finally, I could come to the only one conclusion if I were to remain intellectually honest, I had to admit that the Old and the New Testament documents were some of the most reliable writings in all of antiquity. So he came to the decision after much study. Lee Strobel says it like this, the former atheist. In short, I didn't become a Christian because God promised me I would have an even happier life than I had as an atheist. He never promised any such thing. Indeed, following him would inevitably bring divine demotions in the eyes of the world. Rather, I became a Christian because the evidence was so compelling that Jesus really is the one and only Son of God who proved his divinity by rising from the dead. That meant following him was the most rational and logical step I could possibly take. Hey, don't be like this person right here. Let's just have a little fun for a moment. Don't be like Lori Laughlin. You know who this is. She's the one from what well, she's from that uh, show Full House. And, and she got in all kinds of trouble with this scandal because she was trying to get her kids admitted to this prestigious school and they messed up with a lot of records and they cheated. Hey, we can't do this. When it comes to the resurrection, we can't follow that example, those footsteps. We can't cheat off of somebody else's paper. We, we got to do the homework ourselves. And I'm telling you, if you do it, once you do it, I know many of you have, you come to the conclusion without a doubt that I promise you this, you will be convinced that Jesus Christ went to the grave and rose again. The next thought is this, when it comes to the resurrection, I need to pay attention to the details without missing the big picture. Notice verses six and seven, and look at the details that are mentioned. It says, when Simon Peter came, following him, that was John, he went into the tomb, he saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place all by itself. Let me ask you this, who would 
unraveled body. I mean, you would never do that. Who would take the time to fold up the face cloths? I mean, here we have Peter and John. John is writing this. He's a firsthand witness of what's happening and what's gone down. Those are essential details that disprove that the body was stolen. So we can't miss the big picture, though. Those are great details. It's like that old saying, you can't see the forest for the trees. And what that means is that you can't focus and get lost to the details or you'll miss the big picture. It's like trying to do a house project. You're in the middle of a complete overhaul in your house and you're fixating on a doorknob. You're going to miss the most important thing. Note to self. The resurrection of Christ is the most important thing in Christianity. Let me illustrate it. We've all been playing a lot of games during this stay-at-home order, and the Zappia family were no different. Other than maybe a little bit more intensity and a little bit more cheating, I mean, that's all we've been doing. Here's one of my favorite games. We used to play it when the kids were small. It's Jenga. Christianity is like a giant Jenga game. And what I mean by that is that each block represents a truth about Christianity, an essential truth. For instance, take this block. This represents the virgin birth. I mean, that's an essential truth. And so the virgin birth is essential in Christianity. Let's take this other block. This one represents, let's just say, the deity of Christ. And again, this is an essential truth about the Christian faith and our Christian living and understanding. Let's take another one. This block, this represents the first miracle. This is Jesus turning water into wine. Who doesn't want a little bit more of that? This is important, the miracles that Jesus did in Christianity. But think of it this way. This block down here, this one is essential. Not all blocks are weighted equally. So if this block down here, if this is the one that represents the resurrection of Christ, everything hinges on this block. Now, you know what's going to happen. If I pull this block out, then what's going to happen? Well, this is the resurrection. If I pull it out, everything falls down. Everything hinges on the resurrection of Christ. It all collapses without it. The Apostle Paul teaches in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if Christ is not raised, we preach in vain. Our faith is in vain. Without the resurrection, we're all liars, he says. Our faith is worthless because we're stuck in our sins. We're all to be pitied without the resurrection of Christ. That's how essential it is. Every single thing, all of this truth, it all hinges on that. Next thought is this. When it comes to the resurrection, I need to respond by faith, not works. It's not about what I do, D-O. It's about what's been done, D-O-N-E, what Jesus did on the cross. Notice verse 8. Then the other disciple, again, here we go, that's John, who had reached the term first. I'm not sure that he needed to remind us that he beat Peter in the race, but he does. He also went in and he saw and believed. If we double click on that word believe, it's used 90 times in the gospel of John. It's more than intellectual consent. It's more than just agreeing with a bunch of facts or reciting a creed. It involves your mind, your emotion, and your will. It's like this glass of water that's sitting here. In the New Testament sense of the word, with my mind, I can look at it and say, oh, that looks refreshing. With my heart, my emotions, I can say, well, I I'm feeling kind of thirsty. But it's not until I grab hold of it with my will, this is the volitional part of every single person, and I put it to my lips and I drink from it, that's the New Testament sense of the word believe. And too often people are just looking at the glass. They're around other people who have drank in the water, but they haven't drank it themselves. Belief requires mind, emotions, and will. That's why Jesus said it like this in John chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. But how? 
How do we drink this water? How do we believe? Well, it's as simple as the ABCs. And again, simple but not easy. A, we need to admit that we are sinners. And Romans chapter 3 says that we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The second thing is B, is that what? Believe that Jesus died and rose again is your only hope for salvation. It's all because of him, what he did, what he accomplished. It's the difference between divine accomplishment and human achievement. That's what separates Christianity from all major religions, that it's about what Jesus has done, divine accomplishment, versus what I can do, human achievement. John chapter 3, verse 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. C, it stands for this. Confess that Jesus is Savior and Lord. We need to confess that with our mouths. Romans 10, 9. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Have you done this? Have you done the ABCs? Because that's what Easter is all about. It's not about this, and let's have a little fun there, as you're sitting at home. It's not about the bunny as you have your basket right next to you and probably are eating too much already. Easter is not about this. Although he is, say, having our care center saying, give a bag, get a bag. So he is contributing, but that's not what Easter is all about. But you may be thinking, I have more questions. And that's okay. That leads us to our next thought. When it comes to the resurrection, I don't need every question answered to begin moving forward. Notice verse 9 is returned to the text. For as yet they did not understand the scriptures. That's talking about Peter and John. That he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. If they didn't totally get it, if they didn't understand it to the complete fullness, then guess what? We aren't either. Don't confuse the first initial decision to start walking with Jesus with the lifelong journey of living with Jesus. See, the decision to start walking with him, that's where it all begins. That's ground zero, and that's evangelism. But the journey, the lifelong journey of living with Jesus, that's discipleship. These guys were on their way just like you and I can be on our way too. There's lots of things that we're going to learn along the way and understand that we don't understand now. Think of the first day at your job. Whether you're an accountant or a teacher or praise God for the first responders that are working so hard and diligently, think about the first day of your job, any job. Did you know all that you know now? Of course not. It's just like that with your faith in Christianity that you get moving and you have more understanding. Listen closely. This is going to help. You don't need to know the Bible cover to cover. You don't need to resolve the supposed differences between the contradictions between science and faith. You don't need to choose to be a Calvinist or an Arminian. You don't need to clean up your act first before you get started with your walk with Christ. Those things will take care of themselves as you continue to grow in him. Hey, take a look at this picture. This is Jody and me at the tomb. We got on a plane we flew to Jerusalem just for you. What do I mean? Well, we're standing at the tomb. This is the original site. This is the historical place. And both of us checked. He's not in there. He has risen. Jesus has risen from the grave. Lastly, when it comes to the resurrection, I guarantee you this, it will change your life forever. Notice what happens in verse 11 as we return to the story. Mary is weeping outside the tomb, but it doesn't end there. Two angels show up to encourage her. Jesus shows up next, and she mistakes him for the gardener. She realizes her mistake. She runs back to the disciples, and verse 18, she says, I have seen the Lord. Just as it changed Mary's life, just as the resurrection changed Peter and John's life, just as it has changed the rest of the disciples, it changed me. And countless numbers of people throughout the last 2,000 years, if it hasn't yet, the resurrection will change you.
In a moment, we're going to hear a story from a guy in our church, great guy, Marcos, and his life has been changed by the power of the resurrection. And as you listen to his story, I want to encourage you to ask yourself the question, has my life been changed? And then I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond. I've been in so many different situations, so many things in my life, and I've always seen God come out on top. My name is Marcos Nunez. I've been coming with my family to High Point uh, since 2018. My father was a pastor, so I was uh, basically grew up in church. At the age of 12 is when I decided to, uh, to make that decision to follow, follow Lord, follow Jesus. Uh, being a, uh, a pastor's kid, um, you know, there are so many pressures because pretty much everyone's looking at you and you're supposed to be this perfect person, you know? And uh, it got to the point where by the time uh, I turned 17, um, I wanted to be out. I wanted to get out. I wanted to leave the house. I wanted to leave the church, you know? And I ended up, uh, from that point, I ended up joining the military. Um, a few months later, 9-11 happened, and we were uh, quickly deployed to Iraq. I know that the families of our military are praying that all those who serve will return safely and soon. Being in Iraq, it was very tough. You don't have the time to go to chapel, you know, you don't have that time to kind of spend, you know, in, in, in the Word. And, and through that, uh, I experienced a lot of heartache. I saw a lot of friends, um, you know, get killed uh, in Iraq. Um, and uh, there's just a lot of trauma, you know, in my mind, in my heart, my emotions were completely messed up. And uh, I carried a lot of, um, just carried a lot of anger. Um, there was a lot of arguments with my wife, you know. I remember, I think it was about three or four months um, went by and I didn't hold my son. He was just born, you know. Matter of fact, I wouldn't even sleep in the same room he was in. I was that afraid of what this stuff was going to do to me. I would actually, on purpose, want to run over animals. That's what it was doing to me. I mean, it was bringing this aggression and this killer mindset, you know. I remember one night, um, I just really pretty much had enough. You know, I went to the living room um, and I just kind of fell on the floor on my knees. And there was a verse that came to my mind, to my heart, and that uh, verse was from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, where it talks about the grace of God is sufficient for me. First power is made perfect in my weaknesses, all of my weaknesses. And I remember, uh, I remember that being, uh, just touching my heart, um, it impacted me to a point where I finally really realized uh, the greatness of God and the smallness of me, you know? And I remember coming to the Lord and just really saying, God, I know you're there. I have faith and I know you're there. I trust that you're there. I feel you, I hear you, I sense you in this room. And I, I wanna come back to you. I know I need you, I wanna come back to you. So I'm giving you my mind, I'm giving you my emotions, I'm giving you my heart. I'm giving you this anger that I have in me, I'm giving it to you. Everybody wants to be on a mountaintop. Everybody wants to be at the top of the mountain. Yeah, I want to be at the top of the mountain. But there's something interesting that God has always taught me, and it's where's the grass greener, at the mountaintop or in the valley? And that's one thing that the Lord has always spoke over my life. You know what? It's in the valley where the nutrients are. It's in the valley where it's where I'm I'm molding you. It's in the valley is where I'm, I'm building your character. It's in the valley that I'm building you to be an overcomer. There's a lot of meaning to that word overcome. Matter of fact, I actually have it tattooed on my knuckles. It says Bellator, which means overcomer. That's how I see the Lord. The fact that he, he, he died on the cross for my sins and he overcame every single sin in my life. He, over, uh, he carries every, bo every burden that's in my heart, every burden that's in my life, every burden that's in my emotions, you know? And that's, that's an overcomer to me. I know that that too is imparted on me and over me. And I just, I just continue on with that. I live my life uh, for the Lord as, and knowing that I am an overcomer. That's an incredible story of a person who was overcoming all things, everything, through the power of the resurrection. Let me ask you this. Has your life been changed by the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Have you become an overcomer, getting the strength to move past these things and get to the place where God is growing you to be the person he wants you to be? 
If the answer to that is yes, that yes, you're all in and you've given it all over to the Lord and you can even remember the time and the space and the place when you did that, I want you to start praying right now for the person that needs to make that same decision to put the stake in the ground to start this relationship with him or to just give everything over to him like Marcos did. But maybe you're thinking, I'm not sure and, and I don't know. And if that's you, this is an unbelievable opportunity as you've just heard that there's so many seasons in life where we get in these valleys and these are the times that God wants to stretch us. Maybe you are like Marcos in that you need to have that moment where you go all in and give it all over to Christ. Hey, do this. Click the Commit My Life to Christ button on the screen. If you want to make a decision for Christ, if you want to do this, if you want to go all in and you're tired of playing games and you sense the Holy Spirit working in you, click that Commit to Christ button. I want to pray for you in a moment. And I'm just going to simply pray the ABCs. Or maybe as you're listening to this, you need prayer. And you can click the prayer button to get into a private chat where you can talk with someone on our pastoral team right now. And you can do this. They'll pray for you specifically about what's happening in your life. And then there's a brand new feature that it's a live video chat. So if you click the live video chat, you can be with one of our pastors right now, face to face, eyeball to eyeball, any question that you may have, or maybe there's a concern that what do you need to do and how do I move forward? Just click that live video link and you can talk to a pastor right now. I'm going to give you a moment before we respond. I mean, isn't technology amazing? If you want to make a decision for Christ, if you want to recommit your life, click the I commit my life to Jesus button right now. I'm going to ask you to pray. Don't let this moment slip by. Today is the day of salvation. Make this the day where you move forward spiritually through the power of the resurrection because you can overcome all things through him. Bow your heads with me now. And I'm just going to simply ask that all of us would pray this prayer together. God, I admit that I have failed you. I've sinned against you. I believe that you sent your son to take my place on the cross and pay the penalty of my sin. It should have been me on that cross, but Jesus took my place to grant me forgiveness and grace so that I can experience eternal life and it starts right now. I confess Jesus is my Lord and Savior. As he rose from the grave to grant me new life, I ask that you would help me to live in a way that pleases you. There are some things, Lord, I know I need to stop doing. Other things I need to start doing. Give me the strength. Give me the power to live in you, for you, and through you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.